All right, guys, welcome to Over the Short Turn, episode three. Doing something a little different here. I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction. My name is Mike. Uh, this episode here, we have Callie Nate on, who is pretty infamous from either no prep, back of the track, street racing, you name it, the guy's done it. Uh, we had a wonderful time. It was honestly a privilege being able to have him in here. And he opens up a lot about his racing operations, setups, technical details, what he has planned for the future, uh, as well as what his opinions are of where small tire racing is going, or pretty much uh, outlaw heads up racing in general is kind of heading towards. And it was a great time. Like I said, uh, wonderful guy, wonderful time. If you don't know who Nate is, I'd highly suggest going on YouTube here and typing in Cali Nate, My Little Pony, or Street Outlaws, or whatever. It's going to pull up. You're going to see the guy doing some pretty badass things. And it, it was great time. Thanks again, Nate, for coming down here, man. We appreciate it. And uh, without further ado, here's episode three, Cali Nate. All right, bud. So you still got me? Yep. All right, man. So welcome. Howdy. Th thanks for coming down here, man. I know. I'm only two hours late. That's okay. It happens. Typical street racer stuff, I figured. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Typically, I'm the other kind of guy. I hate being late. Yeah? Yeah, I don't like being late. And then I, I roll with one of my best friends, Jason, who's perpetually always late. Mm. So, yeah. A little yin and yang there it usually works out, though. Yeah, it works out good for us, honestly. His, uh, his mentality versus mine kind of even out. <laughs> I'm a little more anxious than him you seem like you're uh pretty obsessed over the details and making sure you're prepared uh no matter what it really comes down to whether it be going out to race at an event or show up to just kind of talk to people at shows or whatever it is you seem always prepared oh uh, you have to um i mean i just try to do the same thing that i would do for the car kind of like anything else i just like to be i like to have everything figured out and a plan. I used to be a lot worse than that, but I've gotten better. So I've been trying to work on schedules and write everything down. You know, when you get old, you forget stuff. I get that. <laughs> I'm getting there myself. Right. But uh, man, so tell me what's been going on recently here. This this past year, you went on an absolute tear. And yeah. it seems like with 2023 coming up here, I mean, it seems like it's just going to be schedule as usual and just going to keep the same program rolling but kind of go back through 2022 for me i mean it we you sent me something the other day that just seemed absolutely not believable but 20 27 shootouts uh we won 18 of them mm -hmm. um semis i think six times and final runner up three times wow so and then one time we didn't make it to the semis i think we made it to the quarters but we usually can go rounds pretty well. Um, again, I think that goes back to what you were saying about trying to be prepared. Um, we test a lot. We have a lot of data in the car. I've got probably a thousand passes in the car now. Wow. So, yeah. So, I mean, you figure there's, we did 27 shootouts last, just last year mm -hmm. and you got to go five or six rounds, seven rounds in each of those shootouts. Sometimes right. we double enter, we'll enter big tire and small tire. Sometimes we win them both. Um, and, um, yeah, you just laps is what makes you good. I mean, you can have good equipment and you can be a good tuner, but if you don't know what the car is going to give you, I mean, you can totally miss a tune up first round and then you're out. I mean, luckily that doesn't happen to me very often, but I mean, it does. I mean, sometimes it just, you can't win them all. No, I get that. And so for me, <clears throat> for me, I I've, I've accepted that. About four or five years ago, I decided that I, I can't be mad if I lose. I just got to use that to get better. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I've I've told people this before. You, you got to learn how to lose before you can learn how to win. And sometimes it's the other way around when people jump into it and they get they're successful early and then they go into a really bad slump mm -hmm. and it just it turns it just. You can get defeated and you yeah. can get snowballed down, man. Right. I'm in that spot right now, personally, like in my racing program. And, like, I mean, but it happens, but right. But you gotta there's always there's always something good that can come out of 
a bad loss or a bad performance or a bad outing. I mean, our last outing, we were in Knoxville and we had a really, really fast competitive car uh, off the trailer. We were really fast. Second round, bringing it on the chip. The guy's going back to bang the light and the thing just sneezed oh. and shut off. It's never done that before, ever. But it was 28 degrees. They called it the snow brawl. It literally <laughs> snowed until noon and we raced at three. How cold was it? It was 28 degrees. It was 28, right. But I mean, I mean, sorry, track temp, like, or surface temp, like, Probably 28 degrees. Wow. I didn't check it. It was cold. I felt it. It felt like trash. Wow. Um, and we we did really good on the first tune. The car was really fast. Um, and we got to the next round. And like I said, the guy went to bang the light. I was on the two-step. Like mm -hmm. it had made the trip up to the three-step. It dropped down. It was solid. And then it just coughed. <laughs> and when it coughed, it shut off. Um, and my buddy Joey... He was actually, he saw it and he sent me a message. He's all, you need to look for this, this, and this. He's like, my car used to do it all the time. Oh, damn. Sure enough, that's exactly what it was. So when it when it was in that fuel table, I'd just never been in because mm -hmm. on some of that backtrack stuff, you got to really, like my car, you got to knock it in the head because it makes so much power. I, I mean, when I have the best cylinder heads <laughs> on the planet for an LS, I mean, it just makes power. So I got to leave at like 3,400 at like two pounds of boost. And we pull like 26, 27 degrees out to get it to go. Whoa. On that stuff. Yeah, it's we have to really knock it in the head. So this is something I really wanted to actually talk to you about uh -huh. because my my racing discipline uh -huh. is very different from yours. Okay. You know, I come from a bracket racing, you know, 90 racing, foot brake racing style right. mm -hmm. where we're looking for always, you know, repeatability, which obviously right. you are as well. Right. And our there, there's a little bit more that happens after you leave that is not necessarily in trying to hustle the thing down the track or down the street, mm -hmm. but a little bit more gamesmanship and judging the other car, things right. like that. Now, you have that as well, but you're also trying to dodge them. Yeah, <laughs> it can get cases. dicey. Yes, it can get dicey, especially <laughs> on the back of track stuff. And, right. And so it's just it's it's incredibly different, especially when you start talking about stuff with small tires mm -hmm. because then you, like you said, a lot of power. Right. And it becomes a power management game correct and i think that that's kind of starting to click in most of uh the the mainstream ideas as far as people that are trying to view it and understand it watching it but walk us through a little bit like with my little pony for instance right like you said you got you're leaving a 3400 pulling a bunch of timing right on no basically no boost R okay so like two pounds waste gate is pounds. wide open right. practically mm -hmm. and so like when you're looking at different surfaces and the challenges that come with that as long as like in dirt racing that surface is going to change overnight it is. it is so it's it's actually going to do the opposite in dirt racing or from dirt racing which is it's going to more than likely get better unless right. someone oils, oils down, it down correct so to a point because sometimes so like if we do like h-town let's take h-town okay. for example so h-town mm -hmm. H-Town is really good, and it changes throughout the day because of temperature. Mm -hmm. One lane is different than the other because of the sun, mm -hmm. and then it also changes with how much prep is used. So I wish that race was water. Okay. I really wish that race was water because the street is phenomenally fast, mm -hmm. but it goes away because you got 12 or 15 different kinds of preps out there, and some of these guys just they cut them with MEK, and then it just turns the street into mush. So like okay. we're constantly moving around in the groove to try to get away from other people's prep. And luckily my, the guy that I use, which is Nick at devil's glue, his prep will, if we put enough of it down, we'll go over the top of it and kind of wash everybody else's out. But still we, it's, it's a, it's a fight to try to get in a good groove. That's not gummy. And that's one of those races where I wish, because there's so many cars that go down, there's six or seven classes i think the car count for the last h town was i think it was like 200 and whoa 290 cars whoa yeah that's a lot of cars to get through in a night yes. holy crap so we didn't finish jason and i won that race and we didn't finish until 5 30 in the morning wow yeah and so like how how many i mean you're opening up the laptop are you making shock adjustments or moving weight around as well? Like like big swings? Like So H-Town, so again, like I'll use H-Town as an example. H-Town, mm -hmm. 
early, I start with the car pretty tight because the street is good. So I won't have as much weight in it and I'll have the shock pretty tight. Um, and as it goes mm -hmm. and it starts to get gummy, we'll put a little weight in it. I'll probably pull a little power out of it. I almost lost a tire one time out there. And honestly, I, I learned from, I was running the truck too, which was in big tire and it actually knocked the tire off um, in like the third round. Mm -hmm. And right after that, I was like, okay, the truck knocked the tire off. I'm gonna be in the same lane. I didn't change anything in the truck. So I better pull a little power out of the car. And it was still on the edge of losing the tire. It was real close. So um, you gotta stay on top of the conditions. That's the challenge. And that's what's so fun about street racing. You go to a track, like a radio prep track. Right. I mean, it just comes down to who has the most money and the, honestly, the best tuner. Like okay. if you can buy the that best makes tuner a lot of sense. and you have, you have a car that makes 4,000 horsepower, you're, you're going to go fast on a radio prep track. I'm not saying that there's no skill involved mm -hmm. because there is, there's a ton of skill involved. Right. It's just completely different. It's another discipline. Ends. Yeah. It's opposite ends of the, of the scales. So I don't think the conditions change as much as they do on the street like that, especially when you get a bunch of cars going and you got all this different kind of preps on the ground. And like I said, some companies use a bunch of chemicals to cut it with, mm -hmm. and it makes it a nightmare. That's that's what causes it to become a little bit more gummy as it yes. mixes with the rubber and, yes. and different compounds mm -hmm. being put down. And okay, that and that particular place, man. If we could, I would love to do water one time there. Water would be phenomenal there. Does it stay more consistent if water it's just is, water? Like water no matter what the road, okay. water is dead consistent. That's the nice thing about water. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's not going to change. And you're just putting more, you're just applying more and more and more rubber. The problem mm -hmm. is with the preps is they're designed to break rubber down oh, to okay. soften it. That's right. right. Yeah. So when you get as much of it out there in a race as like that race, I mean, there's 300 cars. Exactly. So its design is to break rubber down. So it's going to start breaking it down on the surface and it's going to start peeling up. People do too big and long of burnouts mm -hmm. in one spot and they peel it up. They just don't know. I mean, it's just something that I feel and we've learned. Like you'll see us one pass, we'll do a big burnout. Then the next pass, it'll be really short and crisp and tight mm -hmm. and only go a certain, I, we're very disciplined on how we do our burnouts because again, it all comes down to keeping the rubber base on the ground so that it doesn't peel up. Interesting. And now like, for instance, if in, you know, sanctioned drag racing at the track and stuff, we more or less know what we're going to get when we show up to a place, especially mm -hmm. if you've been there before, if you yep. know somebody that's been there before, you know, hey, this place has a bump in this lane or whatever. That's you know? the challenge of a street. And But now not only at the street. And you're moving. Right. You're moving spots, number one, mm -hmm. right? You're going to have different crowns in different lanes. Yep. You're going to have You're going to have different lanes. Like you'll go to, DFW is really bad for this. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you'll go to a road, <laughs> it's concrete, and you look at it and you're like, well, that lane's going to be two tenths slower. And sure enough, it is. <laughs> and it's just, it sucks because everybody has gotten so fast. Technology has gotten everybody so fast. So it's it's taken the gap that mm -hmm. was big and, and closed it up. Like three years ago when I was running the Z, I felt the gap was pretty big with four, five, six people. Like, mm -hmm. And then everybody else was, there was another gap and then another gap. Man, everybody, it's all tight now. And I'm just as fast now in the pony as I was in the Z. And oh. the and the pony is a thousand pounds heavier than the Z. Wow! It just comes down to to learning learning your car and learning the software and learning the program and testing mm -hmm. because I never thought I would go as fast in the Mustang as I did in the Z. Now the Z was out and out faster. If I ha if I nail the tune up in the Z, it was faster. But it was one of those cars where it was three out of 10 times you do that. The pony right. you unloaded, it just goes like every pass. That's why I'm so good in the car is because I know it gets me down the first pass. I know what it wants. And then we just chip away at it after that. And it's just repeatability and consistency in that car. That car is just 10 and 10, 10 out of 10. It just makes it hit, makes that's, the hit, makes the hit. And that's what you want, man. Yes. So, so. now one thing I've seen with, with some other racers is depending on like a surface that they're seeing uh, or that they're going to go to, 
they'll change tire brands, let alone compounds. Oh yeah, I do too. So I was going to ask you that. I don't. I don't want need to know Constantly. why. You don't got to give me the secret. We'll go from but, a radial. If the road is good enough, we've raced on the street on radials. Really? Yeah, and sa- we ran a race in San Diego, and um, we weren't really even supposed to be in it, and we we got a spot in, and um, I knew the road. I'd never been down it, but I knew it, and mm-hmm. I just gambled, and I thought a, a Hoosier, the Hoosier, um, I think it's their pro bracket radial. It's the smooth right. Hoosier. Mm-hmm. I figured that tire was forgiving enough that – if I could get it hooked early, that would be the ticket. And man, we were fast. We were going like five O's, five teens. Damn. 100 and almost 50 miles an hour. Damn. On a 28 on the street. How sketchy is it to drive that thing on the top end? Is it trying to walk a little bit? On a radial? No, it's like it's, it's, on, it's there. It's just there. On a slick, yeah, it'll move around. On yeah. a 29, 5, 10, 5, like the DO6. Mm-hmm. Anything over like 155, 160. That, that little it, soft sidewall yeah, starts kind of. Yeah, it moves of, around a lot. Yeah, okay. moves around a lot. That so makes sense. A lot of times, like if it's a real fast surface, we'll go to a Mickey. The okay. Mickeys are better on a faster surface. Everybody knows that. So mm-hmm. um, we'll switch back and forth between a Mickey and a Hoosier. Um, like for Thunder Valley, when mm-hmm. we did Outlaw Armageddon, I, I honestly, halfway through the event, I don't have the power that some of those guys have. I mean, they're mm-hmm. they're big blocks yeah big block Hemis twins and, and all that right stuff. i just yeah. don't have the power so right. just um, measly little ls motor right <laughs> um oh here comes gavin here comes gavin to give you your parts yep your salesman taking care of you there i know right thanks buddy is it for me did you find everything did you have to have somebody else find it though right no, I found it. did you, you know, he, he packaged it himself too wow. yeah thanks buddy <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, bud. Have a good weekend. Um, so, like for there, we start with a slick mm-hmm. and we transition into a radial just because the radial is going to get us. If we can hook it, we can figure it out soon enough. We can usually pick up a tenth. No kidding. Two, three mile an hour. Yeah. Even on a no prep. Yeah. So that, that was another thing I was going to ask you is that how much, you know, what's the different type of preparation that go into, you know, say going to a street event to a road you've never been to versus going to a no prep event that you've never been to before. So like a no prep front side, honestly mm-hmm. for us, um, is pretty easy for us. I have really good tune-ups for both cars, for Jason's car and for my car. Um, um, usually we'll nail it off the trailer pretty well. Mm-hmm. And then we just start going from there. Um, because most of them, like, unless most of them, I say most, there are some tracks that are definitely trickier because of bumps. Okay. Like Brown County, which is um, War in the Woods. Yep. That is the bumpiest track I've ever raced on. At about three seconds, all four tires are off the ground. Yes. <laughs> it sounds like Paris. It's wild. <laughs> it's wild. And um, But again, I still went back to my basic front side, no prep, 28 mm-hmm. tune-up, and it got us down first round. Um, I did walk the track and I made a couple of revisions to it just down track where the bumps were. But other than that, that's kind of what I start with. So as far as prep goes, it's pretty easy to prep the car for that. Um, the more challenging is when you're going out on the street because you have to set the car up a little bit more neutral mm-hmm. because you don't know where you're going. And you get there and you may have never been here before. Could be a virgin road. You got to carry a lot of weight with you in the trailer to make changes. Um some of us run those weird looking goofy bars on the back. I seen you just used one the other uh, what maybe a, a couple of weeks ago. That was in Knoxville, yeah. yeah. How how'd that work out? Did that it change anything uh, really different for setup wise? Um, yeah, I don't have to run near as much weight. Okay, that's the that's the thing. I don't have to run as much weight. Um, it just moves that bias so far rear. Yes, and high. Yep. So your CG moves and it just makes it rotate the car way easier. So um, then you're just honestly battling wheelies at that point. So. Which of course you can mitigate with power and well yeah and and it has a wheelie control in the car and stuff so yeah i mean because it's such a trash surface when you go to the backside stuff you got to have the front loose just right it's got to be loose our first pass at knoxville was full loose and it wheelied pretty much all the way down the track it (laughs) stair-stepped and like the wheelie control was just pulling it down all the way down the track and then um it stair-stepped at like 450 feet and then um so the next pass i tightened it up but it still wheelied again so 
I've yeah. done I've done a four hundred foot wheelie before wheel stand in a truck before at Bowling Green, and yeah. I thought that was like just bl- mind blowing. You know, is yeah. it, square body S ten, you know, with a little square dash mm-hmm. on it, and kind of came up, rode on the converter, and I could still see the horizon in, in my time run. And then I go into first round, and the thing comes up, and I can still see the shutdown because the track started to tighten up. And then it banged high gear, Mm -hmm. and it just kept climbing and climbing. And I was like, "Oh, damn!" And then so then I just started driving it off the wall, and I'm like, "We're going straight." It was slow as hell, but (laughs) yeah. And so, but when you say that at the that's going six, you know, thirties, I think that truck was going. You're talking about going a whole hell of a lot quicker than that. Well, I mean, but on a backside race, really not. Not really. I mean, we'll run a bunch of mile an hour. The turbo cars right. will run a bunch of mile an hour out back. But like in the front half, I mean, we're going like 150, 60 foot, <laughs> 140, 60 foot. And you're going like 4.0 and then to the, the 330. To and then from like, so my car, you'll hear it at like three seconds. Mm-hmm. I put 10 pounds of boost in it and I'll run out the back at like 15, 16 on that backside stuff. So do you think the backside stuff is a little bit more of an even playing field and it comes down to who's kind of got the wit and knows their, their yeah, setup? Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's it's who can stack weight better, okay. who can manipulate weight and get in the car to rotate better um, and understanding how a four-link works and how to apply it and because you're never going to do anything early. Right. The biggest thing is to just get it stuck and the quicker you can apply that power then obviously the quicker you're going to go. So, I mean, we, we picked up from at Knoxville from our first to second pass, we picked up th- almost three tenths and that's, we were fast our first pass. So I felt that's good, a lot. but then, it, you know, it sneezed and yep. knocked me out. So. That's racing, man. That happens. And man, I walked up to the guy that, that beat me and, uh, he had the biggest grin on his face and he's all, man, <laughs> I had normally, I normally I have bad luck, but this time I was on the good side. I was all, Hey, that's sometimes that's how it goes. I mean, that's right. Like, you can't take anybody for granted. No, like, I, I anybody don't you so. line up next to can beat you at any point in time. I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly believe that. And, yeah. And listening to you, you know, you've obviously been doing this for a while. How long have you been involved in, in just drag racing? I got in, my, in general? I got my first street racing ticket. This is going to date me in 1998. Okay. And my first street How much was ticket, it for? Uh, $750. Damn. That's three, a lot of money three in 98. points. Oh. They were making an example out of me. Yeah. And they I was were. in like a 15 second pickup. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> officer, I wasn't really even speeding. <laughs> no, I was. I mean, and the, the officer came up to me. He's like, you know what I pulled you over for? I was like, dude, you just saw me race. Like, mm-hmm. you don't, I'm not going to lie to you now. Right. Uh, what's the point? So what got you started into my brother? Your brother was the mm-hmm. bad influence yes. that went down the di- the downward spiral of yep. poor decisions that yes. led you here. In um, I don't know, I was probably six or seven. Okay, and he had a '66 Fairlane with a Cleveland in it. And, okay, uh, back in the day, it was like mm-hmm. a 12 second car. That's fast. That's as a hell, long man. time ago. That's fast. Yeah, couldn't keep it together, but it was a 12 second car, and he took me for a ride in it and just pinned me in the seat. And, and that was it. That was it. Everywhere, anytime he took that car out, I wanted to go with him. That's awesome. My man. mom hated it. Of course. But, man, that was it. I was hooked. Yeah, that's the bad. way it usually happens, too. Bad. Yeah. Bad, bad. And then how did that how that progress from there? Like, what was your what was your first, you would consider, a race car? Um, I had a 1979 Ram 50 D50 pickup. Okay. That's the one that I got, got my your ticket, ticket in. in. Right. Okay. And it had a 2600 G54B Mitsubishi with side drafts and a cam and long tube. And like it ran okay. I mean, 15s for a four cylinder pickup. Pretty back damn in the day. good. It's not bad. And then um, I took that out and I put a small block Chrysler in it. And I ran it like that for like six or seven years. Um, it went 10, I think it went 1080s back in the day on a 26.8. Damn. Yeah. So um, it was a 360 with, I think, a 150 shot or 200 shot on it. And it ran great. It was fun. And then um, I bought a duster. Mm -hmm. And I had the duster for, I don't know, four or five years. And it would go mid-10s on the motor. I never squeezed it, but it would go mid-10s on the motor, which, again, for a small block Mopar wasn't too bad. No. And then... um, my son was born. I sold the duster and I had an El Camino. 
And mm-hmm. then that's what I raced for the longest was an El Camino. What was the setup in the El Camino? Um, mini. So it had a big block in it, had a small block in it, it had an LS in it. Wow. Yeah. So you ran the gamut. I did. Um, the the fastest combo I think was the big block. Mm-hmm. It had a 500 inch um, square port big block deal with, I think it had like four or 500 horsepower nitrous on it, fogger and stuff. When are we talking about? What kind of time frame? Um, that was probably. 15 years ago 15 years okay yeah 14 somewhere around there it was fast it went uh it went 820s and this is all like kind of at the racetrack or screwing around the streets yeah you know i mostly street race that car Mm -hmm. um that car worked really 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 good on the street like really good on the street um power glide big block um i drove it though i daily drove that car solid roller 11 to 1 496 deal and i drove it to work every day and it was fun that was that was the car that everybody knew me by right um and then i still have it to this day oh that's cool um it got wrecked had throttle hang on it and it hit a building actually of all things damn yeah so it's actually i finally kind of started to get going back on that because i really want to get it back Mm -hmm. um and i talked to my body guy back home and it's ready in primer right now for me to pick it up when i get back so oh that's awesome yeah so that's killer man so uh you know walk me through you know from an outsider's perspective like myself when i want you know you're i don't think it's a secret you know you've been on the show yeah and uh street outlaws for what we're talking about (laughs) and um there's uh there's a slightly different version of it that has begun to air. Right. And so uh, tell me, you know, when you were first on the show doing the deal against JJ. Well, that wasn't my first time on the show. That wasn't your first time. What was your first time on the show? My first time on the show was an absolute horrible flop. (laughs) So it was with 405 when they would travel. Okay. And um, I was in my buddy Eric's car and... Man, it fucking knocked the tire off and decided it was going to go off road. And, <laughs> and it was horrible. And it was crazy because, like, that car had never done that before. It had rained all day. We think it got some water stuck in the doors or something. And, you mm-hmm. know, back then we we're poverty, man. Open trailer. Yeah. And, and it rained literally all day and then cleared up. And, you know, it's a race car, like, send windows. I think we had some water in the doors or something. Okay. And when it, when it left or did a burnout or whatever, it might have dripped Drop out of the entire. out of the holes out of yeah. So yeah. I, that's the only thing we can think of, or it just or we missed the tune up. But we went to a road that was ten times better than the road that we tested on, and we carried the tires for two hundred feet on the road that we tested on. So I just found it a little odd that it knocked tire off. Right, and then I was kind of long for the ride and didn't hit anything. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah. Didn't tear it up. It's because it's a real pretty 68 Camaro, big block, 632, mm-hmm. nitrous, big tire, blah, blah, blah. But that was our first go around. And then um, that was, I don't even remember when that was. It was a long time ago. And then um, we did, we went to a JJ event mm-hmm. in Vegas, one of the very first ones. How'd you find out about it? Like, how did they get you looped into it? Um, because I was already involved once before. Right. So then they already have my contact information. They contacted us and just asked if we wanted to do it. So, mm-hmm. um, and then it's kind of progressed since then, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and we went to it. It was a JJ deal. And God, that was the California episode. That was a huge brawl. Oh, like, tell I me mean, about it. Fights. Well, Holy crap. because we were out there and we were trying to change the way he was trying to do his show. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it just caused drama and then <laughs> people started calling him a bitch not me i started walking away i didn't want nothing to do with it i was like i ain't getting in a fight and i turned around and walked away and then man all hell broke loose and it was like a f- it was a brawl <laughs> like a straight brawl his son beat the shit out of some dude and then <laughs> man it was like bodies flying everywhere people jumping out of back of trucks <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. Sounds like WWE. It Monday was, Night Raw man. Or it was something. crazy. And them guys from Memphis don't fuck around, man. I believe it. Right? So um, so we didn't even race on that. We packed wow. up and left. And so fast forward like, I don't know, two years or three years. 
And my buddy Bodie hit me up, say, hey man, they're gonna, they want us to, to put together something. And this is kind of the first time that Bodie and I had worked together. <clears throat> and Bodie struggled on Street Outlaws. He really struggled. Mm -hmm. And um, so he reached out to me and uh, another buddy that does a lot of street stuff in California, Billy Spain, and um, asked if we would help put a team together or a group at least, right? And uh, from California, and we we put a put a decent group together, and that's when we went over there and socked them in the mouth and took all that money from them. Yeah, that was for some serious cash, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like our first pass. Actually, the big money. So it didn't even start out like that. So the first night, it was just a small tire shootout. Okay. In Vegas, and uh, the first night, I ran um, um, Beetlejuice, which is. Um, um brian Britt, mm -hmm. and super cool guy i'm friends with him we had the biggest bet but it was low dollar it was like 500 bucks okay so i won we move on to the next round so they did like first round the first night mm -hmm. second round is the next night and we're getting there and we're unloaded or unloading and jj and the the crew the, the posse the, the little posse <laughs> that rolls with him yes um, the, the, the females of the, the Memphis group, they roll through and they just start talking shit to us. Like we're scared to bet and we're really not, but I have respect for Brian. I wasn't going to try to big bet him. Right. So, and we had the biggest bet, 500 bucks. It wasn't big, but I mean, we had the biggest bet. So then I call Bodie. I say, Hey man, these guys are talking mad shit. Like we're scared to bet. I was like, he's like, don't worry. We got it. I said, I know we we're rolling deep. We got it. So. The first decent money race was with Alex, actually, which he was in um, his gray car, which is called Problem Child. And um, I forgot who he was racing. Anyway, it was for 10 grand a side. Whoa. And his chase is a race shit. Okay. Yeah. So, and I told Alex, I said, man, I gave him the rundown on when they jump and when they don't because I've watched them, I studied their films. Like I went back and I watched a bunch of episodes. I studied when they would jump. So I had a pretty good idea when they would jump and when they wouldn't and how they would jump. And I told him what to look for and man, the boy sat, thank God. They jumped, he sat. I actually reached over and clicked the power off on his car <laughs> and we had a hold of his wing so he couldn't move. And that started it. So that was 10 grand, boom. So then they, then it's me and um, I think it was me and Trish, and she was in um, Heifer. Okay. And man, the betting started getting big. And I think that race was like 27 aside. Good God. And not 2700. No. 27,000. Aside. Aside. Holy crap, because, dude. Uh, because at that point, I, I feel. They started to get a little emotional because we just took ten thousand from them. Exactly, and so now and they need to recoup car out. that money. Right, so they're they're starting to bet with a little bit of emotion instead of trying to do the hustle. And that's where I feel we got them is we got them away from their hustle and use their hustle to our advantage. They kind of hustled themselves. They hustled themselves a little bit, and because I knew how to watch them jump and like we were just mm -hmm. prepared, and so it went. And it was twenty seven aside, and um, he flagged us and. She left a little early, but not early enough that it was going to be a jump. So I left with her. I don't know. I was probably a quarter car behind her, a half car behind her, and I passed her by JJ. Wow. Yeah, I went right on by, trucked on down, 27 aside, come back. What's that feel like? It felt good. I didn't have a lot of money in it because I was broke at the time. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I just bought my truck, and I'm one of those people that won't bet big unless I have the money that I know that I can afford to lose. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to bet my rent money. I'm just, that's just not me. So I'm halfway responsible, not all the way responsible, just <laughs> half. I can relate. <laughs> so um, we come back and this is what I meant by they started betting with emotion because mm -hmm. JJ immediately walked over to Bodie and said, whatever money you guys can stack that car and um, old heavy next round. Oh, okay. And I looked at Bodie. I said, "Take that bet all day long." I said, "Whatever amount of money that they want to, they want to bet." Because I saw the truck. It's it wasn't fast. Right. I felt we had. It made it easier for us too because I mean I felt we honestly had four or five tenths on every Memphis car there. Okay. And every one of them. So they pull us up to do that race, 
And um, we had paid Chief to flag the first one with me and um, Trish. That's mm-hmm. right. It was Chief that flagged because I wanted a fair flag. I didn't want to get hustled on the flag. Right. That and, makes sense. And he had mentioned, well, why don't you have Chief flag? Done. Perfect. And then so he's like, well, you're going to have to pay him. I don't care. I'll pay him. I'm going to make money anyway. So I think we ended up paying him 500 bucks to flag. It was the best $500 we ever deal. spent, man, because we knew that we would get a fair flag. So we walk over to JJ, and we're like, all right, we got 50 grand. Oh. Yeah. And he goes, oh, oh. I s- <laughs> we look over, and I see Sam go like this. I was like, oh, okay. So now we know. So... They're they're fumbling around and they're like, oh, we got like 25 or something like that. And then Trish was like, hold on. So Trish made a phone call and then boom, they had another 10 grand. So I think it was 35 or 37 aside the next pass. Holy shit. So they pull us up. How are you feeling in the car right then? And I there? felt good, honestly, because I felt like you got I the got matchup. The, I, I got what I wanted. Mm-hmm. I didn't get the lane I wanted, but we we're fast. I felt in both lanes. But I had the monkey off my back the first round, which I knew the Nova was faster than the truck. So I knew even if like he got out on me, I'm just going to truck right by him. So they line us up. We do our burnouts. They send us down, and JJ didn't jump. Like, he didn't jump, so I waited. Whatever it was in my head, I waited. I was like, okay, JJ's not jumping. I need to wait. He never left. He was thinking I was going to jump. He was expecting you. Wow. The reason why he did that is because they broke it. The truck was broke. So he put up, they put up all that money. With a broken car thinking I was going to jump. They had five cameras on me to see if I jumped. I didn't. I waited for Chief to flag me. Holy cow. Because it comes back to knowing what you're racing and yeah. knowing that I we had four or five tents on these guys. I could give them the break and still go get them. Wow. And that's that's what it was. So then the next chip draw, I just told JJ, I said, man, you just throw that chip bag away. We're calling you out every round. Because <laughs> I didn't want to race my guys. Right. So we ran um, we ran Hercules the next pass, like $300. <laughs> that de-escalated yeah. rather quickly. <laughs> and he jumped. I just sat there. Oh, my God. That's... And then I ran another one of their cars, jumped. I sat there. I got paid to just sit there. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't get his data, but I was pretty fast on the road already. So I was like, whatever. You guys are going to pay me to sit here and watch you make bad passes. That's fine by me. <laughs> so I didn't. We got to the finals uh, with the guy from Oregon. And mm-hmm. Man, he's a buddy of mine. And we kind of talked. Hey, man, I won't jump. You won't jump. He jumped a little bit. I went and chased him and didn't catch him. He made a good pass. He, right. he did what he had to do yeah. to beat me. I, I mean, I was sour at the moment because we had talked about not jumping. Mm. But I look back on it now, and it's like, whatever. I mean, that's the rules of the race. Exactly, right. So, I mean, it don't matter unless unless it's like your brother and, like... You're going to have to live with him every right, day. Right, right, right. And I'll, now it's like the show, it ended up making him kind of look bad once they aired it because, I mean, you see in the, in the interviews and mm-hmm. me and him talking that, yeah, we're going to go together... And or at least go on the arm drop, right? Not going up or not jump or cheat or or push it. And you know he did a little bit. And I mean, we ran him down. He was shit two cars out on me to three thirty, and I drove up to his fender. So we were coming back. Yeah. Um. Just didn't have enough room. Damn. Yeah. So we ended up losing. We ended up losing the whole shootout. But man, I think took we, home the money. Man, we made some money that night. <laughs> And then it continued on with another, like, we did a big tire shootout, okay. like, a week later at the same spot. So we took our truck out there, and then mm-hmm. I took the pony out there on small tires. Man, I think we made it to the semis in the pony and small tires. Whoa. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Yeah, we went we went rounds. And that's when, man, the car was ugly. We had just put the big motor in it from the Z. Mm-hmm. Um, so it had the Frankenstein heads at that point and the... Um, freak show intake and all that good stuff Mm -hmm. and then um, had my aluminum 427 in it so we did that because before the small tire race it had an iron motor in it Mm -hmm. and i was like man we're going to that road we really need to put aluminum motor in it so that's when we made the call to pull the motor out of the z and put it in the put in the mustang so you mentioned that now you know when i think about 
if if someone you know like in for instance in the bracket racing world right if someone wants to go run a full schedule you know hit every big money event all that other stuff it, there's a lot of equipment that gets involved yes and obviously a lot of things that are not just race car equipment but like travel equipment as Correct. well mm-hmm. <clears throat> so my truck has two hundred thousand miles wow on it. and it's it an looks 18 it, i'll say it looks really new <laughs> it's an 18 i've put 120,000 miles on it in two and a half years Dude, that's a lot of windshield time. I know. Wow. I know. I travel a lot. So, like, walk me through, you know, because if someone were to come to me and say, I want to go do all this stuff, I immediately have in my head a checklist of what's going to be necessary to get through the year. When talking about your stuff, you're obviously a little bit more or a lot more uh, higher on a power level. So, the the fatigue time on parts is a little shorter. And we make the power, but mm -hmm. we don't use it a lot. Oh, interesting. That, because we do the backside racing okay. and or street racing. I mean, it's a little bit easier on parts. Even front side, I don't see more than like twenty pounds on a front side. And how much power are you thinking? It's enough to go one hundred and sixty miles an hour. Damn. So I mean, it probably makes fuel consumption wise, it's probably eighteen, nineteen hundred, maybe a little less. Okay. Um, maybe sixteen hundred flywheel or something like mm -hmm. that. I mean, but we don't. I overbuilt the power train in the car so that. We don't have to have it out every hundred passes. We can go two or three hundred passes and pull it out, go through the connecting rods, mm -hmm. um, and just service it at that point and freshen it up. I do have a spare motor, mm -hmm. um, which we have hurt. We have hurt it a couple of times. It's broken rods a couple of times. Um, we've since switched to a different brand of rod, mm -hmm. and it's been solid since. Um, but we did break two rods um and it beat up the block we broke it once in the z it kicked a rod out at like 300 and probably 50 passes wow and that was just me going too long on it right and then i fixed it put it back in the z we ran a couple of races and then i that's when i decided to get rid of the z because it's too small and it's going to kill me <laughs> so i pulled that motor out and put it back in the pony mm -hmm. and i think it had 80 passes on it and just broke a rod yeah and it's just one of those deals. So I, I won't use that rod anymore, but um, we've been pretty good with stuff. I try to stay on top of maintenance. That's a big thing is catching it before it happens. So Absolutely. we pull the pan off like every 50 passes. Okay. Look at bearings, cut filters all the time. Um, valve lash tells you a lot. Yes, so every does. time we take the car out, like on a race weekend, I'll have the valve covers off and check it. Mine's super easy because it's zero lash. Oh. So I set them at one. And like, it's super easy to go through the valves. It's very easy on the valve train. It doesn't have an aggressive lobe. So, um, but the valve train tells you a lot. Mm -hmm. If you're missing the tune up a little bit, the valve train is going to tell you. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just try to stay on top of maintenance. That's, that's the biggest thing. And then every time, so literally uh, probably once a year, we'll pull the tranny out and have the trans just looked at. My guy in um, California does it at, um, transmission specialist he does all our power glide stuff so um, awesome and then actually he just built me a lockup 400 now too okay so, that's going to be interesting well it's supposed to go on my new car okay so i have another car it's just not done it's been kind of locked in chassis jail for a while but hopefully it's going to be done in the next month or two it's a big block or ls so it'll take the motor that's the spare motor for the pony mm -hmm. it'll take that or a really neat little aluminum short deck big block oh hell yeah with a single uh jose one i think it's got a 116. okay so hell yeah and that can be big tire or small tire um the car will take bigs um it was my big tire car it used to be a big block ford with three kits and um and it was a real deal big block car and we took the measurements for the quarter panels on the pony and put a new set of quarters on it to shrink them back down and mm -hmm. I, I don't i don't have the money to big tire race it's too expensive like it's i barely can do what i do with small tires everybody thinks that we make all this money doing it really you don't i mean you win you win 20 grand i mean you figure you win 20 grand and you're gonna spend four or five of that every time oh just easily. to do just for tires and fuel and maintenance and getting there and everything else i mean within that month you're gonna spend that yep so i mean it goes away fast so I mean, it's nice to win, but you, you got to stay on top to keep the program profitable. Correct. So we constantly trying stuff and, um, you know, you guys help me out with 
new stuff and it's got the newest f710s on it now and so um and power is not really our issue but i mean just trying different stuff with the chassis that's that's where it's all at that's that, what it sounds like yeah it's yeah. all in the chassis and all in the shock we picked up a new shock sponsor um jeff thomas the guy that puts on war in the woods okay um it's a uh, thomas race service uh they're in indiana okay and uh he just got us some new long travels that he built for us for the back of track stuff and then i'll send him my current sand tufts that are on it and he'll go revalve them revalve them and actually the valving actually my sand tufts work great they're just not they're not long enough oh you don't got enough travel on them mm -mm. they're standard length and but the valving is excellent i i had another set of long travels on it that i borrowed from rank and um they were just too slow like on a bad surface they did not they just didn't move fast enough and mm. i put my sand tufts back on and boop like instantly figured it right back out again interesting yeah so they had the travel but they were just too slow right so the valving was too tight no matter so, how much you loosen the thing up it's correct. still just not going to get there correct the valving was just too tight and so the sand tufts they're fast so but if you want them tight you tighten them up and they'll lock down like you'll jack it up and it'll it'll hold the wheel hmm. so that's why i like the valving in the sand tough it's that's a great great strut i like that strut a lot so i just want them to go through it freshen them up and put a longer arm in it and then we'll have two sets of struts at that point that makes a lot of sense but yeah. I, you mentioned in a lot of cars here you're mentioning some other folks that you uh, lend a hand to how many cars at, at, worst case scenario <laughs> do you have your hands on when you un, when you drop the door um it depends on where we go but like in california three or four um when we did the yellow belly race i was doing seven whoa yeah you did seven cars when you were here at yellow belly i did i didn't know that it was i knew lot. that you were running and then running i was around. running back and forth between the nova and the pony and but yeah i was managing seven cars what'd you think of yellow belly oh it's a blast <laughs> isn't it a cool little place it's man? so much fun um that is one of my that was one of my bucket list tracks it's really fun it's very fast it's like, shockingly quick people kind of sleep on that we ended up actually resetting the the track record the there, track record mm -hmm. um but that track's fast like amazingly fast we set it once with the nova and then we reset it again with the pony no kidding so the yeah. pony's got the record at the moment i i think so unless somebody unless else, somebody broke it yeah. right right which so, i mean i wouldn't doubt it wasn't super fast but i mean it was still into the pretty well into the force so i mean it was pretty fast so damn yeah that's fast as hell for the yellow belly for the gut it's the shutdown oh dude the shutdown is yeah man me and ryan ryan and i had a race i think we were in the semis of that that actual race and we came through the stripe side by side oh and we're both doing the doing the mm -hmm. the shuffle and like that just comes with knowing somebody and racing with somebody long enough i stayed on it mm -hmm. just knowing in the back of my mind ryan's pulling shoot early he's going to get slowed down before me i'm going to clear him then i'll get on the shoot and slow down and it worked out because we were he ended up in my lane oh wow but i shot out past him and gave him enough room to get over and it because it gets narrow it does it goes to one lane right it gets down to one lane up there mm -hmm. and especially when you're hauling ass you don't get a lot of time to negotiate that no you don't and it's bumpy so right. like if you're on the brakes you'll drag the front end exactly i almost ripped the oil filter off of it holy shit um on a fox body where it holds the the rack mm -hmm. it has like those little half moons you yep. ground those flat <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it was that that tracks that tracks wild but honestly the sketchiest wildest track i've ever been on though is brown county I, I mean war in the woods with that's what i was gonna say with war in the woods i i feel like that event kind of that's it, the pinnacle it, it gets a lot of shine right but it's still like there's so many people that still don't know about it and it's such a cool deal the places it, it is the most visually nice yes. to look at and it, it just it feels like that's where outlaw racing yes, belongs 100 percent. that track that event has the most atmosphere the most like it gives me goosebumps when i got there i was like i got there and i was like dude this place is so legit like it you don't understand it until you're there and you walk down the track and it's literally no like the groove honestly is maybe a foot wider than this desk <laughs> and then it's grass and a guardrail 
And then halfway down it at 300 mm -hmm. feet when you're pouring the power on. Oh yeah, and then there's a jump. Yep. Then you yeah. go, then you got to hit that 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 single. Then you jump, <laughs> and then once it's back down on the ground, then you start rolling the power back in. And then when you're at the finish line and you go to stop, you've only got 900 foot to get it done. What? Yeah. And then my goddamn parachute didn't work. Pretty much every pass. <laughs> The fire crew at the other end is watching me come in, and I'm sliding in. Er, 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 and I honestly, I only ran the thing out one time out the back hard, mm -hmm. and that was against um, Duvall um, because he was fast, and that's the they he works with the guys with the Frankenstein car. Okay, and um, with the Preston brothers, yes, yeah, and um, he was fast, and I knew he was fast. And I had people come up to me and they're like, man, if he's anywhere near you, he's grabbing buttons and he's going to try to stuff it around you. And I was like, okay. So that was really the only pass that I really, really leaned on it. And I was sideways into the grass. Holy at, shit, buddy. At the end. Oh. Like I went, the pass was fine. Right. But shutting it down and getting stopped, I slid past the fire crew into the grass. Because I could, the damn parachute would just literally fall It'd just out. Just fall and just do nothing. <laughs> It'd do nothing, or the or it wouldn't deploy at all. Like the cable would hold it. Like oh. it deployed one time out of all of them, and it was of course on my slowest pass. <laughs> so now it has. We put a launcher on it now, so we won't have that eliminate problem. that issue. Yeah, we won't have a problem with that. It had one of those stupid pilot shoots, yep. and man, that shoot sucked. It never come out. It fall out on the ground. You drag it on the ground. The, the guys are like, "Why didn't you pull the chute?" And then they walk back. Oh, you did. It's just laying on the ground. Like, well, no shit. I did pull the shoot every time. <laughs> Suck, man. Those, those guys, poor guys in the paramedic truck are just sitting Dude, there. Exactly. One time, the guy's eyes was like this big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So now you go from, you leave, you know, like Brown County, right? And that place, obviously, to outlaw racers is basically that's like, the pinnacle right that's the super bowl it's like it's like daytona for nascar mm -hmm. or indianapolis motor speedway for indycar like yes. it is the joint yes and how big is that place or that that event war in the woods how much money is that to win it was 25 25 grand okay and that seems to be fairly i mean that seems on the upper end but mm -hmm. it seems it, that small tire stuff is starting to elevate a little bit more with the payout. It is. Um, because so we had, you know, obviously buy-ins and then Jeff put in with, he gets tons and tons of sponsors. He works his ass off to get all these sponsors. So I didn't just win money. Mm -hmm. I got, um, uh, a helmet sponsor to paint my helmet. Uh -huh. Um, I got, I won wheels from billet specialties. Um, and then I got hooked up with Jeff mm -hmm. and like, I've told people this before, like sometimes it's not only just the racing and everything else. It's just, sometimes it's the experience or the, or the people that you get to meet along Absolutely. the way. Absolutely. And Jeff didn't know me from, from Adam when I reached out to him cause I wanted to go last the year before and the weather just didn't permit it. Mm -hmm. And I was a little, that was when diesel was like $9 a gallon and I was scared to drive out there and it get rained out. Right. And it, they ended up running it. Um, that the weather was able, they were able to work through the weather and they got through it. But so, but I stayed in contact with Jeff the whole time. And man, nicest guy, super, super humble. Helped me out when I had questions on how to get there or, or what, where should I stay or how do we park? He set us up with good parking. Like he, he honestly reached out and took care of us. So, um, as far as like a promoter goes, I mean, like you couldn't ask for, in my opinion, a better one. So he works hard to right. get all these sponsors. So the sponsors are what help fill that big pot. Cause there was, um, I think it was 67 cars. That's it was a not big bad, field, man. It was a big field. Yeah. And we ran till five in the morning. Holy cow. And literally he comes over to me and he says, Hey, the rain's here in 15 minutes. I said, okay, I'll be right up. So we ran, we, we got the guy that was racing in the finals and we went up there and we made the pass and about four or five minutes later started raining. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. Wow. So luckily we got it off. So when you're looking at a schedule or events that are going to be coming out, right? What do you think if you, if you were able to win every single one of them, what's the max payout of every small tire, either it be a, a street event or a back of the track, front of the track, you know, no prep, whatever it may be. 
what's the what's the absolute market cap for small tire racing? Well, there's overall? a race this year that's a hundred grand. So I'm glad to see that coming around because in you know we're spoiled in in top bowl bracket racing. You know we have two million dollar races. We have all these huge things. I think this upcoming year we're gonna have uh, from what I've seen put out so far, we have like four and a quarter million dollars. Wow. For that's just to win. A lot of them pay down really deep. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, big money bracket racing has been around since late 80s, early 90s. It's had a long ramp to get up there. Mm -hmm. This, the small tire and even big tire stuff, you know, the no prep stuff, back of the track, this is all fairly newish to as far as a a platform for heads up racers. Mm -hmm. And I really like it for the industry standpoint because it's a lot more blue collar. It's a lot yes. more individual. It, there's a lot more character in it mm -hmm. than some of the other things. And, and I really, I love it. I think it's wonderful for the industry. And I think it's something that's honestly going to help carry the manufacturing side of this industry for a long time for a foreseeable future. Yeah. So where do you think you see this going? You know, you've been around it for a while. Where, where's this heading to? Um, well, what I'm seeing is you're going to see a whole bunch of big tire guys that can't compete in big tire anymore. And it's no dig on it. It's hard it's to hard, compete. Man. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. And I mean, you got all these big tire, no prep king cars that go 360s, 370s. Right. I mean, that's, those are million dollar operations to try to compete Literally. with. Literally a million dollars right. at a minimum. That's, right. Cause, that's cheaping cause out. The guy who owns the pony, mm -hmm. his name is Emmanuel. He's building a no prep king car. Right. And I told him, I said, get ready to spend a million dollars your first year. And he's like, well, I don't think I was like, that's how much you're going to spend. Cause you got to have, it's not just the car. It's not just the motor. You got to have two or three of everything. And then you need help. And then you need help. And then you need a big, you need a big truck and trailer. Like you can't just do it on an open or a 28 foot enclosed. I mean, I guess you can. You Right. But you're going to be going to be difficult yeah. because I, it's difficult for me in my car with a 28 foot and, you know, just a three quarter ton pickup. Sometimes I'm out of space. You know, if I, if I'm going to be gone for a long time, I'll take a spare tranny. I'll take a spare motor. You got to take fuel and this and that. And I don't carry half of what those guys have to carry because they're literally going every, like every weekend, it's mm -hmm. like boom, boom. And the schedule's grueling. And the attrition's higher on parts, everything. Yes, because so, they make more power. Right. So they're harder on parts and they break all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it's just <clears throat> a lot of big tire guys that aren't competitive in big tire anymore are now taking their chassis cars, which I think there's going to be some rule shifts here pretty soon that are going to probably phase those cars out mm -hmm. because... It's tough when you got a car like, I mean, the Pony is a 6.0 certed, 25.2, yeah, 25.2, but it's stock f firewall, stock floor pan. It's got a lot of bars, so it's heavy, though, because it still has to be that stock appearing kind right. of car. It's not a tube chassis stock double. It's not a, right, it's not a double frame rail tube chassis car. Right. So where those cars are 18, 1900 pounds, and then you put ballast in them and you're at 2,500 pounds, where a car like mine, it's 2,700 pounds, and you put ballast in, it's over 3,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to probably be rule shifts. that are, There was for a little while, and then they kind of eased off. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to come back again where they're going to be like, okay, it's got to have stock firewall. It's got to have stock four pans. It's got to have stock strut towers. It's got to have X amount of stock frame that's actually still usable not mm -hmm. just scabbed on there because that's what I did with my Z. Right. I literally bolted on stock strut caps on top of the old strut on top of my aftermarket struts and I cut 18 inches of stock frame rail out of it, cut it in half and sectioned it onto the round tube double frame rail chassis. Just over the top sleeving that's it. That's all I did. Yeah. That's all I did. Because you can. Right. And it had enough stock firewall that it meet the rules. But Technically, really, that I mean, when you're when you're trying to lump all small tire cars together, man, that's that's tough because you got a car that weighs eighteen hundred pounds versus a car that weighs three thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. That's obviously a massive discrepancy. It is. Um, for me, I'll race it anyway. I don't care. Right. But some guys don't want. Some guys just can't. I mean, they don't have they don't have a car capable enough to do it. And it's easy to say, well. Just make your car capable. Well, it's not that easy. I mean, I race a hundred thousand dollar plus car. Mm -hmm. Like 
Oh yeah, legit. That's that's what that car is. Mm-hmm. And I, my other car is more capable when it gets done because it's one of those that is a gray area small tire car. I mean, it, it's a it's a double frame rail car, but it's got. 18 inches of stock frame rail. It's got stock strut towers. It's got a stock firewall. But to say it's the same as a pony is not. Right. It's, it's kind of like not. comparing the the these 235 radial cars to like a Pro 275 or X275 right. car. Mm-hmm. It's just totally different, different flavors. Different worlds. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so you're gonna. So what you're saying, if I if I got this right here, is is we're gonna see a, a shift from. Some of the guys that that do have the big tire stuff, and they may have to change car completely. Right. But the pool of racers is going to because of the money. Right. Is going to grow because mm-hmm. the money is there, the which means there. the money is going to continue to grow Correct. and compound on because top of itself. Because you're going to get sponsors to these events because right. it's going to bring in fans and it's going to bring in big names, and so then the big names bring in more fans, and then you know it just mm-hmm. makes more money. It makes more money for the track. It makes more money for the promoter. So. Um, Right now, I feel the small tire no prep deal is honestly where a lot of the money is, other than if you're in the no prep king series. Right. Then, I mean, you make pretty good money. Um, but I mean, there's no reason why a competitive car can't go out in small tire and pick and choose where they go and win a hundred thousand dollars in winnings. That doesn't suck, man. No. I mean, some of the best guys that I know, some of them are on that board over there, hopefully to get them in here. I mean, the, some of the best years outside of winning a million-dollar race is between 85 to a buck 25, buck 50. Mm-hmm. And that's a really good year. And now you got to keep in mind, wow, that was this year? Damn, that's yeah. a good year, buddy. Yeah. That's a really good year. Yeah, but I mean, still, we spent a bunch of it to do it. Exactly, and and the other thing is too, you know, like it, it all depends on if you. There's other side of logistics of it on if you own your own car, if you're paying your own entries, if you're doing all these mm-hmm. other things, and then that comes down to what kind of split you have. Right. There's there's a whole economy side of this that is on the operations side, let alone from what we experience here in the shop on the manufacturing side. And it, it's really interesting because having the knowledge or just a little bit of insight as far as where some of these things are heading in the heads-up world, which I've had an inkling that, that things are going to kind of continue that way in the independent promoter fashion, mm-hmm. in the small tire side. And it's honestly, it's refreshing and exciting to see. Well, then you see... Then you see the street outlaw stuff. Now they're oh, now it's we got to go back to small tire. So now it's going to push mm-hmm. more guys to want to do small tire. So tell me about that a little bit, or as much as you can. I um, guess. Well, I wasn't even involved in that. The okay. four hundred five show I wasn't involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, my car was too scary for them. Oh, it's got a cage. Mm. So their rules were a little weird. You can't right. have a funny car cage, and um, I think there was had to run on pump fuel or something so yeah something you can you could get run e85 yeah. um and i mean i could run the car on e85 um but the biggest thing was a cage my car's got a funny car cage and mm. that was part of the rules you couldn't have a car with a funny car cage interesting i went i i hope that that kind of brings some people in as far as like wanting to get into uh, into it on the introductory side because there are a you know there is a support class at a lot of these small tire races right that are a, a slower, true street, right? True, true street, street. Um, which technically that's what the pony should be in. That car with steel doors is a true street car. It's got carpet headliner. That's hilarious. Stock dash. It's a seat and doors away from true street. Wow. Yeah. That's no joke. Holy crap. That's hilarious. Right. I, I, so, I didn't think about it that way. That so when my other car gets done, mm-hmm. that's why I wanted. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to buy it, but I just really enjoy the car. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've had great success in the car. I've been lucky enough to have a friend that just lets me do whatever I want with it um, and help me along the way. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, And so, but the other car will fit true street or will fit small tire much better. And it's six, 700 pounds lighter. It's a better tool for the job. Correct. And then I can transition the pony into doing true street stuff. I put an alternator back on it, mm-hmm. and I put doors on it. It's right back to True Street. Damn. It's got a 15-gallon fuel cell. It'll drive all over the place. Because mm-hmm. that's what... So when we bought it um, from Dwayne, we bought that car from Dwayne Biddle. Right. 
And um, that's what he did. He did a true street style class where mm -hmm. he had to go run 30 miles or something mm -hmm. and then go and then go race. So um, he did it on a radial track. Um, we just do it on the street. Exactly. So there are there are a lot of these like front side no prep deals that mm -hmm. have true street or outlaw true street or some sort of like street class where you got to make a drive and it's got to be registered and it's got to be insured and it's got to have steel doors and roll up windows. That's so the big, big thing. That sounds to me, if I'm the promoter and I want to do a small tire event to bring out a lot of fans and also bring out a lot of racers, but I want to do a heads up event, then I'm looking at doing something with the small tire stuff that's going to pay Correct. at least 10 grand. And I'm probably going to do a true street event that pays whatever X. Right. And one thing I've actually seen that, that blew my mind when we were at, uh, when we were at PRI and the on the gas guys were there with that truck crawfish. That stuff, like him or uh, the guys that on the gas, and then uh, like uh, Gator at midnight, midnight yeah. like this all wheel drive truck trend is something I never expected to see yeah. and is cool as hell, right? <laughs> it's very different. And those things haul ass, yeah, they're, they're fast. fast, they're fast, but they are running into transmission problems. Yes, there are, so limitations. they've hit the limit of the tranny, and they're gonna find out real quick when they put three speeds in those in the coyote trucks, mm -hmm. they're not gonna be as fast, nope. Because you're not sitting there at eight thousand or eighty five hundred at every shift. Exactly. There's so a much more fallback. There's much more fallback. There's a lot more converter slip involved. Mm -hmm. They're gonna find out that it's not gonna be as easy. So I feel that a little bit that's why they haven't made the change yet. I know that they've been talking about it and Manuel might have done it already. Um, but that's a big deal. Like especially with a coyote that doesn't make a ton of torque. Yeah, it doesn't make much power below 6,000, to be totally honest. Correct. So then when it makes the shift from 8,000 or 9,000 down, mm -hmm. it's, it's gonna, a big pull down. It's a big pull down because it's three speed now instead, yep. of, instead of 10. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, today, I don't know if you've been on uh, Facebook between last night and today a whole lot, but uh, really. Eric Dillard went out there and absolutely he made the third quickest pass ever yeah. in something with doors. Right. You wanna, it was at NHRA weight. And the first thing that me absolutely and, flying. The first thing me and Dave noticed is it, he was like, "Jesus Christ, what transmissions in that thing?" I'm like, "Buddy, it's got to have a Liberty, dude. That thing yeah. just bang, 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 bang." And yeah. it, the same principle applies. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're just keeping it in the meat of the power. Exactly, just keeping right. it up as high as you possibly can because that's mm -hmm. where that combination loves to live. Right. And it's so funny to see the tr the the same things that apply to something going 540s at 268 miles an hour apply to these four by four trucks mm -hmm. with coyote motors, something that doesn't, right. have, doesn't even have push rods. Right. So it's the physics don't really change. They're just uh, amplified in one way or another, depending right. on the application. Yep. So, um, you know, talking about street cars and stuff like that, you're making a, it, we can edit this out too, if you want, but you're, you're making a move if I'm not mistaken. I correct. Am. No, you don't have to edit it. Everybody knows. I okay, am, I am moving. Um, I'm actually, Probably end of February, okay. I hope to have my shop moved. And where's that going to be at? Um, in Wichita. Okay, in Wichita, so, Kansas. Yep. All right, and that's, that's where you came from today? Uh-huh. So you're working on the place today still? Yeah. Man, putting in the hours, I love it. Yeah, so I share a shop with Jason and my buddy Nate. Okay. Um, Nate's ICT Wireworks mm -hmm. uh, does really, really beautiful race car wiring and honestly street car, whatever. Um, and then... R and M. That's Jason and my shop, I guess you would call it. Um, okay. And you know we do race car stuff. Um, we're actually, hopefully, in a couple months, going to move to a huge, huge facility that's going to hopefully bring in all of us together into one building, so that a car can just roll in the door and then roll out and it's done. So I bring you an S10 and say, hey, I want to go have a badass small tire paint, whatever. body, chassis, engine, transmission. Everything all insulation shop. wiring the whole yes. thing, and if I want, and then tune it. I was gonna say, and if I yeah. want, I can call you and say, "Hey, Nate, I'm having problems getting this thing down the road or right. track or whatever, uh -huh. and it's just one quick drive or plane flight away." Yes, mm -hmm. that's awesome, man. What's uh, so? What is the the outlook that you see from the business side of how much that has grown in your side, and and what you see going forward? Well, to be honest, like. For where I'm at right now in California, I, I kind of just, it was very small mm -hmm. because California, you got to be really careful what you do. Yes, you do. That's why I'm really looking forward to moving. There's other <laughs> reasons why I'm looking forward to moving. Um, but 
that is one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to moving. Um, it gets me away from the smog Nazis in California. Mm -hmm. That's and a good way to put it. Honestly, I mean, but that's the truth. I mean, you can't even buy parts in California anymore. No, there's several distributors of ours that do not send right. parts to California. Like, oh, you want to buy an AEM wideband O2 gauge? Can't sell that in California. Seriously, just a gauge. It's dumb. Wow. It's really dumb. It's really dumb. So, you know, you got to... You got to backdoor parts in. You got to, we'll, we'll send cars or companies to go get stuff for us in, um, at the border. Mm -hmm. It's, it's horrible. So as fast as I can get away from there, the better. And so move, making this move to Kansas, obviously going to put you right smack dab in the middle of the country. Right in the middle. Better for travel. Yep. As far as getting to events because. Four or five hours I can hit a race any weekend I want, I think. Honestly. Hell yeah. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, you're like, what, maybe five-ish hours? Unless now. I use my Google that I use today. <laughs> to get you here. <laughs> then it takes seven and a half hours to get from Wichita to Weatherford, Yeah, which was bullshit. <laughs> you get that sometimes. <laughs> God damn it. Right in Oklahoma, it's like, oh, we have a faster route. And I look, I was like, okay, whatever. And I hit sure. it. And I, I was like, dude, this is taking me way out of my way. And then it kept taking me further out of my way. I'm like, what is this thing doing? It was either going to be that or you cussing, being on I-35, just being mad as hell. Backed up. Sitting yeah. There. Because there is that section where they're doing mm -hmm. all that construction and you'll sit there for an hour. Dude, that's been here since 2015 when I moved here. I know. I, like, I don't get it. I what are they doing? It. I don't get it are at all. Are they just moving one dirt pile to the other it, side of the road and then back feels, and forth? It feels like it, man. <laughs> it honestly feels like it. <laughs> it's like Caltrans, but not in California. No shit. So what what do you got going on for this uh, upcoming year? You know, where do you plan to be as far as event wise? What's your schedule looking like? You know? Um, so let me just look at my schedule. It's probably the easiest. Yeah, there, there you go. So I did um decide to take off. Unless it's very, very convenient, February and March. So okay. I get moved. Because if I keep racing, I'm not going to move. So I really need to get moved. So there was a race in February. Obviously, um, there was two. But I think I'm just going to miss those both. Um, I am flying back to California to go to um, a race out there that Bodie's putting on. Mm -hmm. But I'm not driving. I'm just going back there to help Emmanuel. Um, this is going to be his first time driving the truck. Okay. Um, the truck that raced midnight right. for 20, oh, yeah. 20 grand. And, that was uh, fun to watch, by the yeah, way. Yeah. That was, that was very entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're going to do that. So I'm going to fly back there on Tuesday, and then I'll be back on the 11th or 12th. I'll be back out here on the 12th. And then um, from there, I'll just be in the Midwest the entire time. Um, so the first race that I have on my schedule is one in Utah that Cody's doing. Um, it's called Basin Bash. Um, and then that's on the 5th of May. And then let's see, we got another one on the 19th. It's called Mega Cash Days. That's that hundred thousand dollar one. Okay, and where's that at? I don't know. It's on my list. It's East Coast, man. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't write down that. I just put down. I just put down what it was, um, because I haven't decided a hundred percent if I'm going. And then there's another one the next weekend called State of the Union, and I believe that's at Darlington. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's see here, Jeff Miles deal. That'll be good. War in the Woods, mm -hmm. um, the first one, which is on June 2nd. And then somewhere along the lines, I'm going to mix in some No Prep Kings. I'm going to go to try to go to two small tire ones. Okay. Um, and then H-Town, the first H-Town is mid-June, the 17th. That's in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And then Jeff Thomas has got... The Gangster's Paradise Race, which is an invite-only, 32 cars, two days. So there's two separate shootouts. Oh, okay. It's 20000 a shootout, I believe. Twenty grand each day. Each day. Um, and I've seen the list. It's stacked, and it's got some guys that race on shows. Okay. And then it's got guys like me, and mm -hmm. then it's got other guys. So it's, it's stacked. I've seen the list, and it's... 
So there's that's going to be one to watch. There's no ducks. It's two days. So, I mean, if you screw the pooch on Friday, you get another swing at it on fr- on Saturday. Um, and it's going to be at Brown County, which mm-hmm. I'm completely thrilled about that because I love that track. And I'm honestly, we're fast there. So, um, and then let's see here. Outlaw Armageddon. I got to go to that. Got to go to that. Um, which it'll be 9 million degrees in July. Yep. But whatever. It's Outlaw Armageddon. Yes, that's right. And I got to go support Mark because Mark supports us. Um, there's going to be probably three or four backside races at Thunder Valley that Mark does, okay. which I'll try to go to. Honestly, I, I've probably got 20, 25 events this 20, year. 20, 25 events? Yeah, okay. that's kind of about the average that I do. Um, let's see, War in the Woods again on September, mid-September. Um, H-Town in October, that's the trunk or treat one. That's mm-hmm. the one that we just went to and won, and then we were there with the, the truck and raced midnight. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and then it's going to be it's gonna be weird because really I'm not going to be any uh, West Coast races this year. Yeah, it's going to be all at least here or East. East Coast, yeah. Yeah, and you're down here this weekend to do something over at Mineral Wells, right? Yes, yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to do that. Um be my first time there. I've I've tried to go to a couple of Taylor's races before and it just didn't work out. And then this race, you guys wanted me to come by last week, I think, or the week before. And then I kind of looked at the schedule and I was like, okay, if I fly out and fly back, then I can go to that race. I can swing by Frankenstein, kind of get it all done all at mm-hmm. once. So here we are. Perfect. We're man. actually staying in Weatherford tonight. Oh, are you? Yeah. Oh, there's only like two hotels here. So right. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure they're both lovely. Um, <laughs> it, it got like 4.5 review. Hey, that's not bad. Right. That doesn't it looked, suck, It man. looked clean. And I, I feel that, you know, just looking at hotels going down the road going mm-hmm. like, man, which one do you think is worth right. the shit? Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> which one tough. am I not going to get bed bugs at? <laughs> By the way, the Red Roof Inn at Bristol, never stay there ever under any circumstances whatsoever. Me and Jason and God, who else was with us? I don't, who was with us? There was three of us. My buddy Chris, mm-hmm. we were in Atlanta, and we stayed, I believe, at a Red Roof, and something with the franchise, man. That motherfucker had cockroaches in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. And hookers outside. Oh, of course. It was bad. Oh yeah, and it was bad. And the funny part is, our bougie ass buddy set us up with this hotel. <laughs> oh yeah, go here. It's nice. Chris, you tripping? This is not nice. I was uh, give you a quick sidebar example of the worst hotel experience I've ever had. I uh, when I moved out here, I didn't bring my race car with me or anything. It was all in my parents' place in Florida. Mm-hmm. And I get out here and I'm you know get a job, all the other stuff. And I was like, well, I need to go get my shit. So I call my dad. I'm like, hey, when can I do? It? He's like, whenever. I'm like, all right, perfect. So I get a buddy of mine uh, I went to college with, and we ride down. Uh, down to Florida and we get there. It's pretty uneventful. We didn't stay anywhere. We just, you know, cruise through, no problem. Hook everything up, drive out, and we go and we stop in uh, Mobile, right? Alabama. Uh Uh-huh. And we stay, we stop at this either Holiday Inn or Days Inn. I can't remember it. And it was the only place that like the doors weren't locked because it was late. We left a little late. So the but, rooms didn't have locks? No, no, no. I mean the hotel. Oh, okay. Like the hotel was not letting people walk into it. Gotcha. There, you could walk out, but you couldn't go in. And so we, we go to walk in, and the door doesn't open either. And I walk over to the side, and there's like three inches of bulletproof glass with a speaker, right? And there's a nice young lady stand, uh, sitting there, and... You know, we go there and um, she's, we're like, hey, can can we get a room? She's like, let me check, you know, and hits things. You know, I got one room. It's got two beds in it. I'm like, perfect. We'll take it. She's like, okay, it's going to be 325 And I'm like, huh? All right, whatever. We're out of options. You know, we're screwed. I slept in my truck. I, honestly, I wanted to, but I was, but my buddy's, he's like 320 and I'm Ooh, like, this ain't going to work yeah. in, in my truck. <laughs> so I go ahead, slide her to the card, you know, get the whole deal done. We walk in there, you know, of course, both of us carrying and shit. And I go in there, drop all our stuff in the room, closed door, locked door. I go to take a piss. I open the door, and in my bag out there was my 9 millimeter. And I go in there, lift the toilet up, take a piss, 
and there's a banana spider like this big just in the toilet chilling and i just start laughing i'm from south florida from the everglades i'm used to this shit and i go benson get your gun there's a fucking dinosaur in the toilet <laughs> <laughs> he comes in there he ain't never seen nothing like that before he's like what the fuck is that <laughs> Yeah, oh, man, that that was by far the worst place ever, man. There was uh, there was blood on the floor. I'm pretty sure someone got stabbed. Awesome. Yeah, and it looks kind of like that in the trail, obviously going out to the door. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was yeah, it's prime spot, man. So if that you're ever in like Mobile, a, that sounds like a story that Limpy had. Yeah, the days in in Mobile. I mean, by far, just a thumbs up. Always got to stop by there and stay stay the night. God. <laughs> But man, uh, I I appreciate you swinging by the shop for sure. Uh, always good to have you around. Glad you're going to be uh, hitting up a local race here. Yep. Uh, wish you all the luck in the world, man. Yeah, and, thanks, man. Uh, appreciate it. I've learned a lot. I hope other folks have learned a lot. And uh, as always, man, like I said, thank you so much for what you do for us. Absolutely. You know you promote us very well. You obviously win kick ass product and everything like that. Talks for itself. Yeah. So uh, just couldn't like be I, happier. Like man. I say, man, it's not necessarily always about the product it's the customer service that comes behind it and i've never had a company that has a good customer service as you guys thank you um you know even even when i was nobody to you guys chris did everything that he could to make sure that i was taken care of and that was on a product that that you Mm -hmm. guys didn't cast i remember that you didn't build you just sold it and chris stood behind it and when we had the problem, he made it right, and then I've been a, I feel a member of the team ever since. I, I, I feel it's a partnership and a, it is and a team for us because I wouldn't be as successful as I am right now without your guys' help. So very okay. much appreciated, and you guys, you guys are kick ass. And anybody that honestly, I, I say it every day. It's you guys are the best cylinder head company, Thank hands you. down, and. I mean, anybody needing anything like that as far as, man, you guys do Hemi stuff now mm-hmm. and you do intake manifolds for the Hemi stuff now. And there's that's the trend right now is all the Hemi mm-hmm. stuff, everybody buying Hemis. Um, but I mean, if you got an LS, this is the, I feel this is the premier cylinder head. You can get solid castings. You can get water castings anywhere from small cathedrals all the way up to big LS7 stuff. I mean... Big bore LS7, small bore LS7, medium bore LS7. I mean, it just you guys going to get you a sales job here, man. You guys are you guys are top <laughs> shelf. So, well, thanks for the kind words, brother. I'm yep. going to let you go, man. Right. Y'all enjoy your uh, night here in the big town of Weatherford. Oh yeah. All right, bud. Well. All right, bud. We'll see you. All right. <laughs>